So I'm going to uh, focus uh, a little bit in this presentation. Um, I've called this ethics and eggs, and the main reason for that is that I like alliteration. If you're trained in the humanities, you have to come up with alliterative titles. Um, but uh, it actually is also a little helpful to uh, focus on a particular um, livestock production system for some of the uh, discussion points I want to get to. Um, the, uh, um, I think that uh, there also is a simplification in the presentation that I'm going to make, which uh, uh, just reflects the sense in which what I'm going to present is not the wickedest version of this case. Um, I'm not, for example, going to talk about issues related to food safety, which, if you work on eggs, is kind of a big deal right now um, after a mammoth recall in August. Uh, I'm not going to present issues that relate to uh, links between human and animal disease, which with uh, bird flu as something that we talk about once a year is also something that makes egg production wicked. And I'm also not going to really talk about uh, the environmental impact of egg production, which is an issue, although probably in egg production maybe less so than some other areas in, in livestock uh, production. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm uh, leaving out a lot that would make this even more wicked. Uh, but what I want to do uh, is to focus a bit on um, the animal welfare dimensions of this. And uh, um, a good starting point is to think of uh, uh, three uh, related um, interest groups, uh, one of which are the food consumers. Um, they uh, eat eggs. Um, a second, of course, would be uh, the produ oh, excuse me, the food con producers uh, uh, are interested in um, affordable food. Um, actually, eggs, I, I think, are particularly significant to talk about because uh, uh, they are uh, staple foods that people know how to use. Um, some of the other work that I do is on uh, uh, foods that are available in uh, urban centers, and eggs are available at almost every uh, little, um, um, you know, quality dairy shop mart. Uh, and if you stand in the doorway of one of those places and think about, well, what in here would be healthy to eat? Uh, actually, a lot of it's animal products. Um, uh, so they actually are quite uh, important and uh, uh, the, the cost uh, elements, which uh, I'm not really an economist, but sometimes I play one on television. That's what I'm doing right now. The cost elements are quite significant from the standpoint of the, uh, of the, the uh, consumers. Second group, of course, are the people that uh, produce the eggs. Um, and uh, what becomes critical for them is that they have to at least be able to recover their costs in order to produce. I actually avoid using the word profit. Um, I think most egg producers do want to make profits, but I don't think all farmers want to make profits, but they all want to recover their costs. Um, and then finally, you've got, uh, uh, in this case, the animal, the bird. Uh, and uh, there um, would be responsibilities that uh, the animals are getting uh, uh, adequate, humane care. Uh, this would have been a fairly traditional uh, value in animal production. Um, and uh, we'll come back to this. This is going to be the main theme. So if we start out with tame ethics, um, in ethics you make a very broad distinction between uh, good things that are not really anybody's particularly responsibility to bring about and um, actions or duties that uh, are the ethical responsibility of a well-defined person or group. Uh, and uh, ethics traditionally is thought to be primarily focused on the latter rather than the former. Um, uh, the former uh, might uh, be uh, the subject of, uh, of uh, a fate or religion, or alternatively it might be the subject of politics, but it's not really uh, the subject of ethics. Ethics is about uh, responsibilities uh, that individual have, individuals have. So if we come back to this, we've got... Uh, uh, two interest groups um, who uh, um, might be thought of as having uh, antagonistic interests. Uh, however, um, Adam Smith has told us uh, that, uh, in fact, the producers don't need to be spurred by any ethical feelings about these com I'm, I'm, I can't believe I'm saying this to a room full of economists, <laughs> right? <laughs> you have to cut me some slack here. I was prepared for something else, right? 
producers don't need to be spurred by ethical motives in order to, for good things to happen in a, in a competitive economy. These, these are things that sort of just happen and they get taken out of the domain of ethics. We will get to the externalities, right? So uh, the primary place where there's a potential for an ethical relationship here is actually uh, between the farmers uh, and uh, the animals. And if we run the clock back to sometime in the past, say 1940, um, I think this actually would have been the way that most uh, producers would have uh, conceptualized uh, this issue. They would have accepted that they do have an ethical responsibility uh, for the care of their animals, and they interpret this as a responsibility that falls on them uh, as individuals, and uh, they uh, 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 feel that they uh, have to discharge this as uh, a part of what it means to own and care for. They might use language like stewardship um, to talk about these ethical responsibilities, but they would, in fact, have been uh, conceptualized as ethical responsibilities. So, however, the other piece of ethics circa 1940 uh, is that farmers would have not seen this responsibility as in deep tension with their role as producers because the animals are not going to be productive if they're not healthy. And so uh, uh, although uh, farmers would have recognized this as an ethical responsibility, it would not have been thought of as something that was uh, uh, creating any tension with uh, their economic interests. So if we start to fast forward a little bit, um, this starts to become a wicked problem uh, with the advent of uh, um, concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, uh, in the, leg in the uh, egg industry. Uh, this really starts, really gets started in the 1940s with uh, systems that involve uh, lots of hens on the floor. Uh, by the 1960s, uh, systems that actually look very much like the ones that are in place today uh, start to come in where the, the chickens are uh, uh, confined in cages. Uh, and uh, the, this is sometimes referred to as the battery cage system. But uh, uh, you, you get the chickens up off the floor. It makes uh, manure collection uh, more efficient. It makes uh, egg collection much more efficient. Uh, and uh, uh, in introduced uh, a lot of uh, conveniences and uh, efficiencies into uh, egg production. Um, but um, under these systems, the compatibility of the producer's competitive interests and the welfare of animals uh, becomes increasingly questionable. Essentially, what you're doing when you are uh, producing in one of these uh, uh, facilities is you're, you're managing your capital investment and you're managing your, uh, your basic maintenance costs as much as you're managing the productivity of the bird would be the short way uh, to say this. And uh, in fact, uh, it turned out that uh, you could um, have a lot of birds die uh, before the cost of keeping those birds alive. I mean, if there's one non-controversial measure of welfare, it's when the animals are so badly treated that they're dying, uh, uh, you could actually afford to lose a fairly significant rate of birds in a facility uh, before uh, it would, uh, uh, the, the costs of uh, keeping birds alive, just meaning that minimal uh, welfare would be repaid uh, in terms of the productivity of the system. Um, so here's your word. Animal welfare starts to look like an externality. Uh, you do have to uh, count animals as uh, subjects that could bear external costs in order to look at this as an externality. And not all economists think that way, but uh, I'm going to suggest that this actually is uh, a classic uh, externality problem um, if we are willing to accept the idea that uh, uh, the animals uh, have uh, interests that uh, uh, can be um, affected by the way the system runs. The other thing that really starts to make this look wickeder, of course, uh, over the same period is that we start to see uh, the influence of a number of uh, philosophical movements. Um, and I'm not going to unpack these in detail. This is something that I'd be happy to do in questions and answers. But uh, uh, we have uh, seen um, uh, first the growth of a significant movement to protect animal interests. Uh, we've had these movements since the 19th century. 
um, they were primarily focused on laboratory animals for many years. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, we passed the Animal Welfare Act and have since amended it a couple of times. And uh, gradually, uh, these groups have turned more and more to uh, food production as one of their uh, interests and one of their uh, primary targets. And of course, the other thing that kind of makes all of this wicked is that, um, uh, well, let me, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm, I mean, I think one of the things that makes this wicked is that it's not at all clear that people who s interpret animals' interests in this way are particularly concerned about the food consumer's interest in eating eggs. And many of them would suggest that people shouldn't be eating animal products at all. So their attitude about what this, how these, this problem should be resolved would be, uh, let's just end animal production altogether and uh, uh, not eat these products. So they have a, a somewhat uh, uh, jaundiced view of the value of actually eating eggs. And then you have uh, some critical philosophical perspectives that make this more complicated. Uh, Rene Descartes, who's the little guy in that corner, um, argued that animals are machines uh, that actually don't uh, have any feelings at all. They're non-conscious. They don't feel pain. Um, still, there are elaborate philosophical and uh, cognitive uh, arguments about this point. We'll talk about some of that if people are interested. And then there are also theological perspectives. Uh, this is St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, who've argued that uh, whether animals feel pain or not, uh, they, are, uh, they are not moral subjects. They don't have any moral standing. And uh, uh, human beings uh, are entitled uh, to use animals uh, however they want. So these views, although they're coming out of the past, are in direct philosophical conflict with the, the rise of uh, the animal rights movement. So. Um, increasingly, yes. Not originally. Um, the, uh, um, I, I would say that uh, I, I don't want to overstate the influence of philosophy. I think philosophers, the sociologists that have studied the animal rights movement argue that philosophers were actually really important in the early stages of this movement, but they also would argue that most of the people that participate in the movement um, don't have particularly sophisticated views. Um, this is going to, I'll come, there'll be a, a better place for me to come back to this point um, a little bit. So what's, um, um, I think the upshot of this, however, is that you really can't plausibly understand animal welfare as the responsibility of individual producers. If you're uh, in egg production, and this would be true of all the livestock industries, you basically have to use the most economically competitive method of producing your commodity. Um, otherwise, you aren't a producer anymore. You go out of business. Um, so uh, um, farmers cannot address the animal welfare problem through the lens of uh, tame ethics. They cannot under interpret this uh, as something that they have a responsibility. I do think that some people outside of uh, animal production do see this as, a, as an animal producer's uh, uh, responsibility, but uh, um, uh, my argument is that this actually really fundamentally changes the nature of the problem. Um, so um, actually, I, I, the main influence that I had or work that I had with producers uh, in the 90s was making precisely this argument that it was something that they had to address on an industry-wide basis. Uh, and starting in the late 90s, a number of industries started to think this way. And the egg industry is probably the one. Another reason to talk about egg production is that they probably embraced the idea that they had to address animal welfare as an industry wide problem uh, much more aggressively uh, than any other. And there were kind of three strategies that were floating around there. One of them is that uh, uh, consumers can just voluntarily pay more for specialty eggs. And you can have uh, cage-free eggs and uh, you know, super organic uh, cage-free eggs or extra hyphenated uh, you know, cage-free, you know, gluten-free, antibiotic-free, you know, X, Y, Z on down the list uh, eggs. Um, you could have uh, bring government regulation in. Uh, and this has actually been the strategy that I think has been pursued in Europe. 
um, has not really been pursued much in the United States. Uh, and then finally, um, you can actually uh, try to develop industry-wide standards. Uh, and that's where I want to focus uh, for the balance of the presentation, because that's essentially. Why would you argue to? Yeah. Why would you do that? You're, I mean, it is true that in the last few years there have been uh, 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 resolutions in California and Michigan where uh, there have been um, things that actually are kind of, I would argue, they're kind of in between government regulation. But um, um, compared to uh, Europe, we haven't done it. <laughs> we certainly haven't done it at the federal level either. Um, Okay, well, how does this uh, um, industry standards approach uh, typically work is what I want to kind of focus on now. And uh, basically the way this approach has worked is that you convene expert committees uh, to develop standards for the industry, which the industry uh, then adopts um, um, usually on a kind of uh, quasi-voluntary basis. In the case of the uh, egg standard, uh, the, the original standards were written by McDonald's, and McDonald's required suppliers to meet these standards. Uh, very quickly, actually simultaneously with that, the United Egg Producers, which is the trade association for shell egg producers, uh, convened their own expert committees, which surprisingly had the same membership as the committees that McDonald's had convened, and they came up with very similar standards. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, the UEP uh, created an uh, incentive program for their members, which uh, consists of a certification that uh, uh, the eggs have been produced according to the UEP animal welfare standards. Uh, and this is primarily marketed to um, major retailers. It's not really very useful at the consumer store shelf level. But many of the, uh, the chain restaurant, mem members of the Chain Restaurant Association and many of the, print, the main um, uh, grocery chains have basically signed on to this program and only purchase eggs that meet the, uh, the UEP standard. And I can talk in more detail about what the standard actually is in questions. Um, so it has effectively now 80% of the shell eggs uh, that are produced in the U.S. meet this standard, so there's still 20% that don't, but um, fairly um, had a fairly dramatic impact on egg production and on animal welfare. Yeah, they're definitely a member, and they're actually one of the one of the reasons I'm not afraid to give this presentation in Michigan is that they're actually leaders in the egg industry in uh, in kind of promoting this whole approach. It's not controversial in Michigan; it is controversial in Iowa. Um, yeah, they produce more eggs than anybody else. And probably a large percentage of the 20% that aren't produced according to the standard are produced in Iowa. Um, <coughs> so how do these expert committees think of animal welfare? Well, they've broken it down into these three segments. And uh, um, there's this nice... Uh, um, mind, body, and nature a way of talking about them. Under the, the notion of animal bodies, you would include all of the standard veterinary health measures, the things that, that vets would normally understand as components of animal welfare. How many of the chickens are dying is the most dramatic measure, but uh, uh, morbidity, growth, and development, the kinds of things that we've actually been uh, doing quite a bit of research on for the last hundred years. Uh, a second category, which has been the focus of uh, a great deal of research just over the last 25 years uh, would be uh, cognitive measures, basically what it feels like to be an animal in certain conditions. Um, you know, is the animal experiencing pain or suffering? Um, is it experiencing frustration or is it feeling relatively satisfied? Uh, and just in the same sense that we apply these categories to humans, we apply them to animals. Uh, we and there have been some very creative research techniques developed to uh, develop measures for all of these things. And then the last category, animal natures, uh, is defined or understood as uh, behaviors that are typical of uh, the species. So in the case of chickens, uh, that would include uh, nesting, 
uh, flapping their wings, uh, bathing in the dust, uh, perching. Uh, these are all things that uh, if you give chickens an opportunity to do it, they'll do it. Uh, and uh, uh, that it is certainly typical of chickens, uh, uh, both historically and in the wild, their relatives in the wild, uh, that they would engage in these types of behaviors. Now, there is a philosophical problem here, which is, how do we actually understand this last category of animal natures? And the two options basically are, we can actually understand these species typical behaviors as contributors to welfare because they are proxies for something that has cognitive significance. If you want to perch and you aren't allowed to perch, you feel frustrated, okay? And what's really significant from a welfare standpoint is the frustration, right? And the presumption is that if you're frustrating perching or dust bathing or so on, you're causing some sort of cognitive dissatisfaction uh, and, uh, um, or possibly even uh, a more straightforward uh, veterinary uh, measure, although the real focus is on the cognitive measures because those are the ones that are hardest to see. The alternative is to actually understand these species typical behaviors as actually constitutive of well-being. That is, um, this is actually what, in a, what defines well-being for uh, a chicken, um, irrespective of whether or not they feel anything uh, with regard to uh, the frustration of these kinds of behaviors. Now this actually gets to be a very significant problem practically, philosophically, it's just fascinating, right? I mean, it, we actually have very similar problems in talking about human beings, um, you know, is, is what makes something good for humans the, uh, uh, the fact that they feel good about it or are there certain characteristics that we think of that humans should aspire to do? Uh, and we actually think less of them um, if, you know, no matter how happy they feel, no matter how pleasurable their life is if they don't aspire to these more significant kinds of behaviors. But, but this becomes a practical problem in developing industry standards uh, and it has in fact led to I think a real uh, uh, point of debate both within the industry but um, especially uh, between the industry and the larger world. So the way that the industry basically has approached these is to take, take uh, uh, to emphasize the standard veterinary things and to take on board uh, the second category, but to follow option one, uh, as I outlined it, and to understand the significance <coughs> of nature primarily in terms of uh, how it contributes to uh, these other welfare measures. So they're broadly committed to uh, my philosophical option one. Uh, but here's how this gets them into trouble. Some very nice research by a group of um, e agricultural economists at uh, Oklahoma State has uh, uh, conducted a fairly extensive uh, telephone survey uh, that uh, to uh, get the public's attitudes towards a number of discrete measures of welfare. And if I'd known I was going to be talking to economists, I would have prepared, brought a better slide for this that actually talks about how this techniques works. Uh, but uh, as it is, in order to stay reasonably on time, I'm just going to stick to my original plan of describing the results. What they did is they came up with uh, three groups. Basically, they had all of these individual uh, indicators, and then they used statistical techniques to see that they clustered into three groups. In other words, people tended to be in one group or another, uh, depending on patterns in terms of the way that they rated various things. And one group uh, they called the price seekers. Uh, these are people that are really only concerned with minimal physical well-being um, uh, of the birds. Uh, they think the birds should get food and water, but as long as they're getting food and water, they really don't care. Then if everything else they care about relates to price. Uh, philosophers would say these are the Cartesians uh, in, the, in the room. Um, then there is a group called basic welfareists, and these are people that tend to rate uh, animal uh, in indicators that focus on pain, frustration, uh, frustration and com contentment. Uh, and then there's another group that are called the naturalists. And these are people who uh, would suggest that the kind of animals, the kind of life that an animal would lead in nature becomes the moral norm. So where are some of the, the places where uh, the, uh, the naturalists and the basic welfare, this is, these are the percents 
uh, 14 percent uh, price seekers, 40 percent uh, basic welfareists, and um, the number for the naturalists is uh, going to be behind the slide, but I think math would tell you that's 46 percent. Um, uh, the, um, where do these uh, things break out? Well, um, a, a good example would be um, predation. Uh, getting killed by a predator is bad on any animal welfare score. Um, it, it actually scores very badly on the standard veterinary health measure, uh, the most non-controversial measure. Um, and, uh, um, you know, welfareists recognize it as bad. But um, naturalists don't recognize it as nearly as bad as uh, um, uh, as the other two groups. So, in other words, if you, I mean, I think that that you know what 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 they're going to view, and here now we're actually interpreting beyond what the survey actually tells us. What they're what they would view is that uh, uh, it's much worse to uh, constrain an animal's. Uh, behavior, you know, prevent it from bathing in the dust or going outdoors than it is to protect it, you know, much more important to do that than it is to protect it from predators. So you're right. I mean, animals do die in nature and they get uh, eaten and by predators and uh, it's very clear that this segment of the public um, uh, views that as less significant and it's a, a clear place where this split between the, the sort of basic welfareists and the naturalists divides on both philosophical grounds and it actually turns out that the public splits on exactly that point as well. Um, other places that would be uh, important, oh there's my 46 percent, um, would be things that uh, would re actually relate very closely to production systems. Um, so uh, one of the key issues that uh, uh, egg producers, all poultry producers are worried about is uh, aggression among the birds. Uh, and uh, this is a, a much larger problem in a free range system than it is in a cage system. Uh, and this suggests to many people in the industry who are taking uh, uh, option one, as I described it, uh, that actually the welfare of birds in a cage system is better than the welfare of birds in an open system. Um, but um, uh, that is actually not the way that 46 percent of the public looks at this. They think it's much better to uh, allow birds to be able to fulfill these behaviors and what they do to each other is not uh, uh, really primarily significant. I've got extra que question marks on here. Um, so this is uh, basically my last slide um, suggesting that uh, um, we now have a lot of different perspectives uh, that are vying for how we think about uh, the ethical relationships with uh, um, with uh, uh, animal welfare. We have uh, the philosophical groups and we have the uh, um, naturalists out there enjoying their picnic and then we have uh, these attempts to develop standards which do even when they're certified humane is a standard that was developed by the Amer American Humane Association. And it's a little more strict than the UEP standard but it too I think takes the same a basic philosophical approach is the UEP approach. To kind of come back to Roy's question about um, different philosophical approaches, within, the, the, within the, the two leading philosophers to write on this in the 1970s and 80s uh, kind of represent the same split. One of them would have been Peter Singer and he describes his view as uh, preference utilitarianism which means that he thinks uh, uh, pain, I mean he will write it as pain, but he thinks that, that uh, if animals have preferences that can't be satisfied, that's what's ethically significant, which is you know, a way of basically saying that he follows strategy number one. Uh, and the, the other one was uh, a philosopher named Tom Reagan uh, who has this idea that uh, animals are subjects of a life is his term, that they have uh, uh, a certain set of of interests that are sort of defined by what it means to be uh, a subject, uh, to be a being that has a personality with interests that endure over time. Uh, and uh, that uh, uh, anything which uh, um, frustrates or stifles the 
uh, ability of any animal, including humans, to fulfill that sort of basic core set of interests is going to be ethically problematic. Uh, and so it doesn't really matter so much how they feel about it, you know, you know just like, uh, you know, I might prefer to sit at home drinking beer and watching Dukes of Hazard reruns. That doesn't make me a good person, right? Um, I really should be fulfilling my potential, and that's a very uh, narrow notion of what it is to be a human being. Uh, similarly, there would be narrow notions of what it would be to be a chicken or a pig or whatever. And uh, um, just because pigs, I, this is, happens to be true of pigs, if you raise pigs on concrete, they don't actually want to go out and wander around in the yard. Uh, but that's um, still, you've still harmed the pig from Reagan's perspective because part of what it means to be a pig is to go out and root around in the dirt. That would be a kind of natural, typical behavior for pigs. And uh, they need to be able to kind of express all of that going forward. When you give this kind of, kind of pro presentation in front of, uh, I've given this presentation at poultry science and you know, somebody stands up and says, you mean that we're actually supposed to go back now and try to breed chickens that actually want to go outdoors? And uh, wicked problems. <laughs> That's my presentation. <laughs>